In Bird Watching Tips Video 1, we looked primarily at how we conduct ourselves in the wild when observing birds. In this short video, I want to talk about camouflage, particularly as it might relate to bird watching. There is a popular perception that if we want to be unseen or undetected in the wild, we had best wear camouflage. This is a very unreliable view, but one that commercial interests do nothing to dispel. Indeed, the contrary prevails. To understand how camouflage might actually work, we must have a regard not to our own senses of sight and sound and smell, but to those equivalent senses of creatures of the wild. A key sense we have to take into account is sight and particularly that part of it relating to colour perception. If we are talking about mammals, many of them have a far narrower spectrum sensitivity than we do. In this diagram, you can get a rough comparison of the relative colour sensitivities of humans, grazing animals and birds. Why do you think that predators get away with such bright colours and patterns which feature the reds and browns and orange so prominently. The almost vivid stripes of the tiger, the gaudy patterns on the leopard and the other big cats that live in the dappled shadows of forested areas. It is because their prey don't have colour receptors in their eyes that adequately register such colours. At best, they probably see greys. In the diagram, you may have noticed that deer, antelope and other such grazers see primarily blues and greens. Take the colour out of a tiger's coat and you get a better idea how he might be seen by a cheetle or samba deer. So what gives a tiger away is movement, odour or sound. The Samba may be aware of the tiger's presence from his odour long before he can actually see him. The tiger's elaborate raiment works because his outline is heavily fragmented by bold stripes. Human hunters now often wear blaze orange or red so that other human hunters can see them and not mistake them for a deer. Birds, however, are very different. Their colour perceptions are far broader than our own, and for most it extends from ultraviolet to infrared. It probably varies depending on the species, but it's certainly broader than ours. So what is the point of wearing camouflage greens and browns when all colours are completely visible to birds? Camouflage that might be more useful is that which breaks up your outline. Bold patterns, fringes and shapeless drapes. Otherwise, just stick to sombre tones without white or flashy accoutrements that reflect light. Not that anyone is likely to wear jewellery or other ornaments on a birdwatching enterprise, but you get the idea. So don't think that your perceptions are necessarily relevant to the perceptions of wild creatures. If you buy camouflage, keep in mind the old saying, fishing lures catch more fishermen than fish. There is a lot of money to be made by selling clothing, tents, hides and other such accoutrements elaborately decorated with camouflage. Commercial enterprises usually promote camouflage that will be convincing to you, not to birds. These days, there is an almost limitless range of camouflage colours and patterns on offer. The people who set up this barge hide for waterfowl hunters may have been better served by painting it with big bold patches of whitish grey and dark green mimic a water surface with big pictures of waterweed. 
That is not to say necessarily that this barge would not be effective, but perhaps its camouflage is less relevant than the fact that it hides humans and their movements. A big stationary shape is not likely to be seen as a threat. For the bird watcher, this little boat might be useful if you can satisfactorily propel it undetected and tether it so that the breeze doesn't blow it about. Camouflage wouldn't improve it. Now we come to bird hides generally. Ignoring those permanently set up on some wild bird reserve, we'll consider the personal portable variety. There is a huge range of commercially available hides, some of them quite elaborate. Remember the fishing lure syndrome. Most bird watching doesn't require a hide. There are two important clues as to what constitutes a good personal hide. One is portability. A simple lightweight hide is far more welcome when you have to carry it a couple of kilometres from your car along some lakeshore or estuary. The other is simplicity. You want one that only takes a couple of minutes to set up. The longer it takes to erect a hide, the more disruptive your presence is and the longer you'll have to wait for the environment to settle down again. A hide is very useful when you are on station three or four hours in the hot sun or subject to other discomforts like wind or rain. Also, the hide should be insect proof. Keeping biting flies and mosquitoes at bay becomes really important after a very short stay. If you are buying, get a small, simple one, big enough for your folding chair and somewhere to stand your lunchbox and camera gear. My chair is a lightweight one with a back which I have fitted with straps so I can carry it like a backpack. I used a camp stool for a long time, but as you get older, you begin to appreciate a back on it. If you are a DIY person, you could make your own hide. Access to appropriate materials though may be tricky and the economics of buying versus making need to be balanced. I have been camping all my life, so I had lots of redundant bits and pieces. For my hide, I used the standard tubular poles from small, cheap A-tents. My original covering was an ex-army personal tent fly. The hide was not insect proof, which I remedied after a couple of seasons. Tent fly material is very thin and light and relatively cheap. My frame posts are pre-assembled and designed to open and close like a concertina. The frame collapses down in a matter of seconds as the forelegs are connected with sliding cross braces. Pole tops are held apart with tubes fitted together at the corners. Making the tubular corner connectors was probably the most tricky. They had to be steel tubing so I could braze them together. A thin flat aluminium strap forms a roof arch. The ends of the strap just slip into holes in the top frame and are held there by the natural springiness of the aluminium strap. I made an extra waterproof roof for more extreme conditions, but that is not essential. For blustery conditions, the threaded pole tops allow guy ropes to be fastened under a wing nut. Despite not having any camouflage characteristics whatsoever, I have spent more than three hours at a time observing a raft of arctic waders many thousand strong 
with those on the edge nearest me being no more than 15 feet away. All I got was the occasional curious glance, probably assessing my protruding camera lens. I have spent up to 30 minutes in the company of a party of finches, no more than 12 feet away, and other similar experiences. The hardest part of using a hide was getting it to the right location and waiting for the birds to turn up. So to be successful watching birds in the wild, keep in mind what is really important. Move slowly and quietly. No sudden moves or sounds. Wear any subdued colour other than white and nothing that flashes in the sun. If you want to be less obvious, the only camouflage that might be useful is that which breaks up your outline. Generally, anything else is just extra expense. Be prepared to sit and wait for long periods. I usually carry my chair on my back, thanks to carry straps I fix to it. A hide may be useful for extended stays in the hot sun or where there are other uncomfortable conditions prevailing. A hide must be very quick and simple to erect and is best if it is very lightweight. Like a clothing, a hide should be in sombre colours, not white and not necessarily camouflaged. <laughs>